Welcome to the season finale of season four of the BizHack Live Digital Marketing Masterclass Series. I'm your host, Dan Gretsch, the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy. And we have a real treat today. Dave Bricker uh, is going to be speaking about storytelling. And the title of his talk is Seven Strategies to Attract Customers with Your Small Business Story. And uh, Dave is an, an amazing uh, talent uh, and, and a dear friend. He's also a BizHack uh, alumnus, having gone through our Lead Generation Digital Marketers Edge program. Um, I wanted to, before we get to Dave and his presentation, I wanted to acknowledge our partners. Um, uh, the first, it's uh, all of this is possible uh, because of the Office of the Mayor of Miami-Dade County, Daniela Levine Cava. Uh, they have funded this series uh, as part of their Strive 305 initiative. The Strive 305 initiative is specifically geared towards helping small businesses in Miami-Dade County connect and thrive uh, in this new digital world. And the Digital Marketing Masterclass Series is really part uh, of a whole set of um, services that they're offering to help small businesses everywhere. So I encourage you uh, to connect with the Strive 305 folks um, and with Danilo, their amazing leader. He's part of their diversity and inclusion um, efforts at the office. I also want to acknowledge our media sponsor, South Florida PBS and their health channel. South Florida PBS is close to my heart because I have worked uh, for television shows on PBS uh, and for NPR, uh, for the show Marketplace and the local NPR station WLRN as my background as a uh, journalist and storyteller before I became a entrepreneur and business owner. Um, we also have just an extraordinary set of promotional partners, uh, and I'd love to read their names. We have the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce, ICABA, the Miami Foundation, the AMA, CIC, the South Florida uh, Interactive Marketing Association, Miami Bayside Foundation, Creation Station, the Key Biscayne Chamber, the Cutler Bay Business Association, the Florida State... Minority Supplier Development Council, the Community Fund of North Miami-Dade, Access Helps, Coral Gables Chamber, Aventura Marketing Council, Beacon Council, and the Coconut Grove Chamber. These are the folks who help us promote and help us spread the word uh, about our master classes. And we're very grateful to you for helping promote this and bring this to new audiences we couldn't reach otherwise. As I mentioned earlier, I am a business storyteller. And I've had a big aha recently, which is what BizHack does in essence is purpose-driven digital marketing. So what we help businesses do is market themselves in a way that leads with their values, that leads with their core purpose, and ultimately leads with what we call their business story. The business story that we're going to be talking about today is the foundation of all of marketing and even the foundation of all of business. And that's why we um, love to have incredible presenters like Dave Bricker who provide different perspectives on storytelling in the business setting. So um, as part of the, uh, season four, you will be getting a handout with key takeaways from today as a thank you for coming today. You'll get a link to our YouTube channel where a uh, recording of this will be uh, shared and you can share that with other folks on your team or others who you think would benefit from it. You'll be automatically registered for season five of our masterclass series, which will be coming up a little later this summer. So stay tuned for more details about that. We're gonna take a little bit of a break uh, for the month of May and then we'll be back uh, in June and then we'll also um, give you at the end of today uh, a little bit of information uh, about BizHack's scholarship program for minority and women-owned businesses. Um, we actually, for the first time, added up all of the scholarships that we've given out over the last two years, and it totals a little bit more than a, more than a quarter of a million dollars to 123 women and BIPOC-owned businesses. And uh, it's one of the great prides of my life that we've been able to touch that many businesses and help 
that many businesses. Um, so um, if you're interested in applying for the scholarship, Tiffany is gonna put a link in the chat, uh, bizhack.com slash apply. Um, and then we'll have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you and me, we'll talk about the programs and the scholarships. And if you're interested uh, in learning more, stick around after today's session, uh, we're actually going to talk a little bit uh, about the scholarship program and you can learn more from there. Um, so with that, um, I wanted to welcome Dave Bricker. Um, this is his kind of official bio. Um, and uh, he's also shared with me um, some information um, about uh, you know, his background as a, a story sailor, someone who has discovered the most powerful metaphor for writing uh, through his many adventures uh, as a sailor. Um, but I just wanna, you know, I, talk, I said, you know, Dave, thank you for sharing with me your intro. Um, I just wanted to talk about how you and I connect um, human to human. And so I'm gonna take just a minute to talk about that before I introduce him uh, more in a professional way. So Dave is one of the most talented and engaging speakers um, I've ever had the pleasure of running across. What's interesting is in business, you, you know, in journalism, you meet a lot of storytellers, like we're filled with storytellers, but in business, you know, it's been hard for me to find fellow travelers in this uh, passion that I have for storytelling. And without a doubt, Dave is one of the greatest uh, fellow travelers I've ever met. He is, um, not only is he incredibly engaging and you'll see that shortly, but he's extremely highly trained. Uh, he has really made a study um, of um, storytelling. Um, and he is uh, the head of Toastmasters and has organized a number of chapters of, of Toastmasters. And he has helped so many businesses with their storytelling. And he also combines that with the rarest of gifts, which he also is extremely technically savvy. And so when you look at like biz hack and the whole idea about biz hack and digital marketing, it's really the left brain and the right brain, the combination of story with digital technology. The biz is the business story, the hack is the technology. So that's what we really aim to do. And I don't think I've ever met a human being uh, in all the years I've been doing this that better kind of combines the soft and the hard, the left and the right, the story and the technology than my dear friend, Dave Bricker. Now, I have to read exactly as written and with enthusiasm the following introduction and I'm going to honor Dave to do that now. Have you ever struggled to create messages that customers actually want to hear? Have you wondered why some messages connect with audiences and others don't? Are you talking about your clients? We're talking about yourself. Today's guest spent 15 years sailing in search of stories. He's the author of 12 books, including an adventure sailing memoir that I have on my bookshelf, two books about writing, and three books about storytelling. His company, Remarkable Stories, Inc., teaches the art of business transformation through storytelling. If you wanna say it, share it, or sell it, bring Dave your story, he'll help you tell it. Today, he'll be talking with us about how stories work and how we can use strategic storytelling to grow our business. Please welcome award-winning speaker, author, designer, transatlantic sailor, tough love presentation coach, pretty good jazz guitar player, and my dear friend and BizHack alumnus, Dave Bricker. Well, that's a tough introduction to follow. Thank you, Dan. All sorts of accolades back in your direction. So let's start with a story. I'm 25 years old. I'm sailing a 26-foot boat in about 2,700 feet of water. Actually, it was deeper than that, but why ruin a good story, right? And I'm leaving the Bahamas bound back for Miami. I've been away for 14 months, looking forward, getting home. And I've got this narrow weather window and I decide to go for it. And I leave the Bahamas and the first six hours is glorious sailing. You can practically hear the harp music. 
But as night falls, it gets a little chilly. And it gets a little windy and the seas come up. The seas come up some more and the temperature comes down and the seas come up and the temperature comes down. After a while, it's pretty rough out there. I take one of my sails down, I'm sailing with one sail. I am flying across the waves. It's rough out there. It's the only time in my many thousands of miles of sailing that I have ever tied a rope around my waist and lashed myself into the cockpit. And I look up to the light at the top of my mast. My battery is dying. That light is getting dimmer and dimmer. But I continue on. The wind is at least behind me and I'm flying across the waves. I'm alternatively doused with this warm Gulf Stream bath water and then frozen by the wind and it's warm and it's cold and it's warm and it's cold and I'm invisible out there in these enormous seas. And of course, what happens? I see lights getting closer. Two freighters, big freighters and an enormous cruise ship. And all I can think of is they can't see me in my tiny little boat out here in these big waves. So there's not much I can do but keep going and try to take evasive action. And I managed to dodge freighter number one, and I managed to dodge freighter number two. All that's left is the cruise ship. Have you ever seen a squirrel in the highway and they kind of do this little hopping back and forth thing? That was me in the Gulf Stream on that cold night. So my path was converging with the cruise ship. And as I got close, I figured I could come and cut behind at the last minute. And I could hear the throbbing of the big diesels. And I looked up into the stern of the ship as I passed. And I saw the silhouettes of people dancing. And I could hear the sound of the disco that <laughs> coming through the glass. And I thought, my God, these people are having a very different experience in the same place at the same time. I'm fighting for survival and they're fighting to get to the bar for their third margarita. Have you ever felt like that in your business? Like you are out there in those big seas and nobody can see you? There are these big opportunities going by businesses that need what you have to offer. They can't see you. They'd run you right over and not even know it. Run you over and not even know it. How are we going to get their attention? So let's stop there. In case anybody is wondering, I don't want to leave the suspense. I did survive the crossing, but more importantly, what I just did at the end of that story is I made that story a metaphor for your story. We all have stories to tell, and we're all out there living life, accumulating new stories to tell. It's a marvelous thing and an important thing to do. But when we tell stories, we need to make our story a metaphor for our listener's story, for our customer's story, for our colleagues' story for our organization's story because if we don't we're just talking about ourselves now hopefully i took you someplace with my story maybe you weren't expecting to be taken into the gulf stream on a rough cold night if i had continued for too long you would have thought well this is interesting but i got disney plus with the national geographic channel what do i need dave for so we have the power of story, but we have to learn to tell our story about our audience, because otherwise we're going to lose them. So storytelling is in. We've got all these buzz phrases like strategic storytelling and narrative strategy. There are courses. Um, Columbia University has a course on strategic storytelling. IBM, Watson, and Verizon have chief storytelling officers that's a C-suite position. Companies are getting wise to the power and the importance of storytelling. I used to update this slide. 
There are just too many people on LinkedIn, over 25,000 people who have the word storyteller or storytelling in their title, not just in their description. And for professional speakers, it's currently the number four speaking topic. But if stories are so powerful, how come nobody teaches us what stories are and how they work? We've all been hooked by stories. We've all watched a terrible movie all the way through to the end because we had to find out how it end, how it ended. And then there are those cases where if you've had small children and you've watched Sleeping Beauty 27 times because your kid will watch it over and over. So what is it about those stories that make them repeatable, that make them watchable? So today we're going to talk about seven storytelling applications, and there's a reason for that. And the actual story behind that is I never thought about it in terms of seven before, but I was given this title to work with. So first of all is leadership. Are you a leader or are you a boss? Are you getting people to perform functions in your organization? Or is everybody taking part in a story, in a meaningful mission? You want to keep employees around. You have to have that mission. You have to have that story. What is the problem we're solving? We're not just making widgets. We're changing people's lives and people will stick around for that. Teamwork. Does everybody understand their role? in the organization's story. HR directors need to understand this because they say, here are your insurance papers, here's your cubicle. Well, that's great. But if you don't pull someone into the corporate culture and turn them into a piece of a meaningful narrative, someone's gonna offer them more money and they're gonna leave, which is part of the reason we have such staffing problems today. Of course, if you can't tell a story, We'll look at some of this today. Your advertising is going to stink. Just think about the last time you even looked at a banner ad, or if you read a magazine, remember paper magazines? How many of the ads did you actually pause to read? 1%? 2%? It's scary how much ineffective advertising is out there because people don't understand the power of stories. And of course, customer service is so important and to deliver that service to deliver that experience we need to understand what is the customer's story why are they there what are they looking for because if we just deal with these things at face level customers are not always easy to deal with they're not always polite they're not always friendly we have to understand their story in order to serve them without going home from work and crying and then of course a business plan is not just a way to make money. A business plan is a way to turn a story into money. And hopefully, I have fulfilled the mission of the seven steps here, but it seems to work out. Let's take a look at stories and how they work. And a lot of people talk about stories in the brain, and they talk about uh, dopamine, and they talk about uh, uh, all of the hormones and things. And the problem is, None of us have ever seen a hormone. So how about stories and the mind? How do we process stories? And this is simpler and easier to understand. We stepped out of the jungle, out of the wilderness 20,000 years ago. In evolutionary terms, it's a blink of an eye. There were still mammoths and saber-toothed tigers walking the earth 10,000 years ago. It's extraordinary how things are changed. And we, as hunter-gatherers, are always scanning our environment. We're looking for threats, and we're looking for opportunities. You want to verify this? Stand on a street corner and look up. Somebody's going to come along and stand next to you and look up. They want to see what's, what's up there. Is it going to fall on their head? Is it going to hurt them? Is it going to make them rich? We are always scanning for threats and opportunities, which if I'm boring, you're going to pick up your phone or you're going to open up an email, a, a, a web browser in front of me, and I'm never going to know that you're looking at something else because I failed to engage you. And what you're doing is you're looking for better opportunities than the ones I'm giving you. I will try not to disappoint today. What results, though, 
with a story is all of a sudden, if I tell my story about you, you're paying attention. You're paying because you've decided it's better to invest in my message than it is to look at Facebook, hopefully. So you're paying attention. And at that point, your brain is hijacked. If I did my job correctly, you were out at sea with me in that little boat. I took you with me. Now, logically, you knew you were sitting at home staring at your webcam for the 11th time this week, but emotionally, you're there with me. And if I did my job right, you're feeling the cold and the wet and the warm and the hot and the cold. And the, I mean, and it's visceral. You can hear the music coming out of the cruise ship. I took you with me. And unless you're an experienced sailor, you're probably thinking on some level, I hope Dave's going to get me out of this because I don't know what to do, which makes me the guide in your story. So when you tell a story to your customers, to your team, when you tell an engaging story that brings people in, subconsciously, they're looking to you for leadership. They're looking to you for solutions. You are the guide in their story. And be the guide, not the hero. You don't want to hear me brag about my sailing experiences. That's tacky. But if I can take you with me on one of those sailing experiences and then offer you some guidance in terms of how to navigate through that and make that navigation a metaphor for your circumstances, chances are I've hijacked your brain, taken you with me, and become a guide. Let's take stories apart a little bit further. The elements of story, and the first one, if you take nothing else away with you today, the golden rule is that stories are always about people. Now, sometimes they appear to be about aliens or talking animals, but stories are always, at least metaphorically, about people. If you're not talking about people, you're not telling stories. If you're not telling stories, you're not connecting. And if you're not connecting, you're not selling. So, okay, I can, I can feel the vibe. Oh, he used the S word, selling. But I'm not talking about selling as a way to extract money from people. I'm talking about selling as a way to communicate, to serve, to influence. Anyone who has put a child to bed is selling anyone who has asked for a date is selling anyone who has asked for a raise or a promotion is selling we are all selling all the time and if you're as anti sales i hate being sold to we hate salesy people not what i'm talking about i'm talking about influence now let's break sailing storytelling down using a sailing metaphor think of you or the people in your organization or your team, someone's got a conflict and they are out on that sailboat on that rough cold night on the stormy seas of conflict. And what they want to do is they want to get to the safe port of transformation. A story always moves from conflict to transformation. Now we always talk about the conflict, right? We see it in those ineffective anti-smoking ads we see the person with the yellow teeth and the yellow fingers or the the um we see in the insurance ads we see the crashed car and the burned houses and you know what it's all conflict and it doesn't work people shut it down they don't listen but show the transformation show the healthy older couple playing with their grandchildren there's your anti-tobacco ad and your insurance ad rolled up into one. People are shopping for transformation. Now, for that sailboat to make it from conflict to transformation, the water's got to be deep enough. And it's interesting, we call this authenticity, but it's very interesting to me that we use the word deep or shallow to describe people, to describe plots in books and movies, to describe circumstances. So for example, if Dudley's situation is that his father promised him a Porsche, but he has to choose between black and red, but he can't get a yellow one because his father doesn't like yellow. 
we're not buying that. That's just not a deep enough conflict, right? Dudley's an entitled little snot and he should be grateful for the black or the red. We don't care. But if he says, you know, this is ridiculous, I'm gonna ride my bike and save up money for my own car, all of a sudden we see that growth, we see that transformation, and we start to care about that character a little bit more. So how do we get to the authentic problem? We do what children do and we ask, why? So when you say, Junior, it's time to go to bed, and Junior says, why? Say, because it's your bedtime, why? Because it's 9.30 and it's time for kids to go to bed, why? And you finally say, because I said so, and you become that parent you swore you were never going to become. But kids know to ask why, why, why? And we often fail to do that, and we find the surface level conflict, not the authentic conflict. And it's a survival level thing. It has to do with food, love, shelter, sex, status, safety, family. It's all of the things that we care about deep down. It's not a new Porsche. Finally, and this is my favorite of the four elements, magic. And I'm not going to get all woo-woo on you, but think about this idea that take gravity. Nobody knows how gravity works. It's a powerful, invisible force. For our sailing metaphor, wind is a powerful, invisible force. For you, your magic is your talent. It's your experience. It's your perspective. It could be your special equipment. It could be your great idea. It could be your fantastic team. It could be your location. Any number of things that make you, as an individual, unique, special, and powerful. That's the wind that you're going to blow yourself from conflict to transformation with. And just as importantly, your clients your or your team. It's that magic you bring to the table that is going to help move them from conflict to transformation. And this is a business workshop. That's how we get paid. So don't worry about competition, because even if you're a barber or a dentist or a traveling anvil shredder, it doesn't matter because there's only one person who does it the way you do it. So be a storyteller, be the guide, not the hero. Understand the conflict of the people you are serving. I recently worked with a hotel staff and we talked about, well, why do people come to this hotel? It's close to the airport. They come to this hotel because after a day of being beaten up by the airlines, they need to rest before they go back the next morning and get beaten up by the airlines again, right? They're not here to go to South Beach. Understand why they're frustrated. Understand why they're tired and you won't go home crying when they're not always the nicest people. The transaction is the byproduct of a relationship. Be a storyteller. Engage with people. If they know you, like you, and trust you, they'll do business with you. And then, of course, storytelling is the art of what to say and how to say it. There are the words that we choose, and there are also the ways that we choose to deliver it. The pauses, the dynamics, all of these things that can influence the way people perceive our message. And of course, the design and the technology. Let's look at a few common storytelling mistakes and I know I'm cruising through a lot of material today because I want to cover a lot and deliver as much value as I can. One of the most dangerous types of stories, and we've all heard this, it's the if I can do it, you can do it story. And maybe you've heard a speaker say, oh, I had a beautiful wife and a wonderful career and a nice house and a nice car and two special children. And then I got into name of drug. And one day I woke up wrapped in newspaper, shivering behind a dumpster. And I said, I can't do this anymore. And now I'm speaking to you. And if I can do it, you can do it. And the problem with that is, a, that person's doing their therapy on the platform, and B, it may be that they can do it, and there's someone in the room who can't. 
and they just left that person in the dust pretending to serve we see this type of storytelling all the time be the guide not the hero unfinished stories you're watching a great movie and 20 minutes before the ending the power goes out and you go oh no story tri crisis story trauma unfinished symphonies unfinished stories wow we get invested in a story so whatever your story is bring it to a conclusion or you're going to create a lot of business for the therapist in the area don't leave your audiences hanging even jokingly i said hey i survived my ocean you know my my gulf stream crossing i mean you would have figured that out and it wasn't the point of the story but you got to conclude where you're going resolve the conflict so people can say yeah i learned a lesson or i had a good time and i went home finish the story pit of despair stories are a particular type of unfinished story if you're going to bring your audience into the darkness don't leave them there this happened there was the the famine or the massacre or whatever it is what happened if you bring your audience into darkness bring them back into light you can get dark as long as there's a reason for doing it otherwise you just depress people and it's very powerful this is an important one stories that don't get told the cemetery is full of stories that never got told it's sad your story is big enough size doesn't matter if you have been in a relationship raised a pet moved out of the house you were born in i don't know how to friendship there's so much, it takes so little to create a story. If you really don't think you have a story, get in your car, go to the Keys or the Everglades, go to a, go someplace, meet somebody, throw a dart at a globe, do something. We all have stories and we think, oh, no one wants to hear my story. It's not all that impressive. It doesn't matter if you climbed a mountain or ran a marathon or sailed across the ocean. Those are big stories, but stories are stories and your stories matter. Great stories are everywhere. Put on your story finding goggles and go on the, on the hunt for stories. They are all around you. Another common one, go beyond the data. So many data dump stories. I offer industrial cleaning services. I'm a dentist, I'm a barber. It's not about what you do. It's not about what your product does. It's not about what your product costs. If you're talking about prices, processes, ingredients, or data, you're not talking about people. It's about what they want. It's about their transformation. How can you help your customers achieve their transformation? Understanding what they're looking for and how to get them there, that's the business you're in. They don't care how you do it. And like the marketers say, sell the benefits, not the features. What about the truth? Journalism versus storytelling. Do we always have to be 100% truthful when we tell a story? Now, I don't think we want to lie to people, but nobody's looking at JK Rowling and saying, you know, all that Harry Potter stuff is a lie. It's fiction, but it's fiction that suits a purpose. Now, when I did that Gulf Stream crossing, I had a lady friend with me on the boat who was pretty scared. Uh, I could tell you all sorts of details of that trip that would just dilute that story. So I massaged it a little bit. I embellished it a little bit. I shortened it a little bit. I wanna help you on your journey. I'm not there to talk about myself. And I'm not there to create a journalistic account of what happened. I don't work for the news media. There's the literal truth, what actually happened. And then there's that essential truth. Be a journeyist, not a journalist. When you create your messaging, do it in the service of the audience. I have a part in, one, in my memoir about a sailing trip through a chain of islands in the Bahamas. In reality, I did that on about five separate trips 
do you really need to do all that anchoring? No, island, 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 island. Let's visit it and get it done and not drag you like, oh, and then I went and two months later, I came here. It's, it's irrelevant. It doesn't help move the story forward. Some other story myth, story mistakes. You know the one about time is money? Time is not money because anybody can sell hours. And if you're working for an hourly rate wage, the better you get, the less money you make. If I'm three times faster than my competitor and I'm charging an hourly rate, people are going to say, well, I'm not going to pay three times. That's a, that's a big difference. They're going to go with my slower competitor. Anyone can offer a product or a service. But your product, your real product, is not graphic design. It's not JavaScript programming. It's uh oh, is it me or did Dave freeze? No, yeah, he froze. I was just about to message you asking that as well. All right. Well. Dave is going to hopefully come back shortly, but you know what he's saying is really rich um, and an area of particular passion and expertise of mine. I actually got a master's degree in storytelling in my previous incarnation um, as a um, uh, you know as a journalist. And um, I wanted to share with you guys a couple books that I was going to talk about in the Q and A, but I can talk about now. Um, and Dave will rejoin us when his uh, computer comes back and we'll finish out the, his presentation. So the first one is The Writer's Journey. It's by Christopher Vogler. If you, like me, are a storytelling nerd and you really want to like dig in deep to the theory behind this, I highly recommend this book, The Writer's Journey by Christopher Vogler. There are three main this is what i learned this i'm going to summarize my six years of at, at fiu mfa in six sentences there are three main theorists of story in the history of storytelling the first is aristotle and he wrote a book called the poetics and it's you know more than two thousand years old and it's the foundational text of storytelling the second you probably heard of is Joseph Campbell. He wrote a book called The Hero with One, A Thousand Faces. Um, and the idea uh, with The Hero with A Thousand Faces is that um, you, all the mythologies from all the history um, have the same kind of core uh, attributes. And that's what he documents here. Hi, Dave. No, I didn't. Perfect. We'll see you soon. We're, we've got it handled. Dave had a transformer blow and he'll be relogging in shortly, as I expected. So the, the second is Joseph Campbell. So you have Aristotle, old Greek dude. Then you have Joseph Campbell, who's a 20th century figure. Uh, he did a series on PBS. He talked about all of the common um, elements from fairy tales and mythology that you can kind of map out. Um, and that's called the hero's journey. And then the third one, and most people don't realize that he's actually incredibly important in storytelling is Carl Jung. So Carl Jung, as most of you guys know, is a psychologist, but what he came up with was something called the archetypes. And there are different archetypes and one of the archetypes is the hero. Another archetype is the mentor. And so when he says, be the guide, not the hero, what he's really saying is very Jungian. He's saying, be the mentor archetype. So here is the chapter on the mentor archetype. The mentor is usually a wise old man or woman, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Your role as a B2B business owner, as a consultant, as a service provider is to be Obi-Wan Kenobi to the Luke Skywalker that is your customer. The mentor is a usually positive figure who aids or trains the hero. The word mentor comes 
from the Odyssey, from Homer. And there was a character whose actual name was Mentor, who acted as a mentor to Odysseus in his journey back home. All right, I don't know if that was six sentences or 10 sentences, but that is a summary of my MFA uh, and the, what I learned about storytelling. And all of that is really beautifully summarized in this one book that I could have saved myself a lot of money and time if I had just gotten this textbook and read it. So the other big question that I have been studying since getting that MFA is how does this apply to business? And the answer to that has been given to me by a book that I've read online but don't own called Story Brand by Donald Miller. And I realized, you know, I need to go get myself a copy of this book so I can hold it up and show it to people. Donald, Donald Miller basically did the thing that I didn't have the patience to do, which is he took Aristotle and Jung and Joseph Campbell, and he figured out how to use that to build a good website, to market to your ideal client, to create marketing messaging. And he has created a whole system and movement called the story brand movement. So BizHack is about to embark on redoing our website and we're going to hire a story brand consultant to do it because he, those folks who have been trained in the story brand methodology understand how to apply the lessons of Aristotle and Jung and, and, and Joseph Campbell to the writing of a website and to marketing. So with that, um, Dave, I'm gonna send it back to you. I just shared some really wonky information uh, that I learned during my MFA about the history uh, and the kind of intellectual heroes of storytelling, Aristotle, Joseph Campbell, and Carl Jung. Uh, I talked about the mentor uh, archetype, uh, which is really what we're talking about here when you say be the guide, not the hero. Uh, and then I shared with them uh, uh, one of my favorite like how do you put this in place, how to guides, which is story brand by Donald Miller. Back to you. Again, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for your patience. We had a big kaboom in the neighborhood and everything went dark. Something with a transformer or something like that. Anyway, this whole time we were talking about this lie that time is money, time is not money. And the real product, again, is being that wind that blows your customer toward transformation. Your product is not ours. Your product is an outcome. Another one, and this is really common with people, for example, in graphic design. I taught graphic design for, for a long time. And this idea like, yeah, you can have purple. The client, uh, give the client whatever they want, please them. And how many designers have I seen where their portfolio is full of stuff it's full of compromises that they made on behalf of the client. And yes, we want to try to please our clients, but real professionals don't hire experts and then tell them what to do. If you're a designer and all of a sudden your client is art directing you, there's a problem with their understanding of the story of the value that you provide. If they think you're there to move the mouse around because they don't know Photoshop, then you have not told your unique value story very carefully, which means just say no to never saying no. When a client wants something that's not going to work, is going to be ineffective, is in bad taste, that goes against the, the grain of what you know is professional, sometimes you have to say no. I just lost a client. I had a client uh, fire me because I refused to plagiarize material for them. And you have your boundaries and you stick to your boundaries. Another one, have you ever had someone tell you this? You need to update PHP. Most people don't even know what that means. This is the epitome of bad service. What the person should say is, I, you need to update PHP and you probably don't know what that is, so let me take care of it for you, or let me show you how to do that in your control panel and your web hosting. All of this techno babble really turns people off. Stop the techno babble, 
a data dump is not a story, but the story of how somebody comes to you with a technical problem that they cannot understand, and you understand the arcana and how to fix the problem and get them back to work or get their message out or get things functioning the way they should, that's a story, that's transformation. Comfort is a valuable product. And sometimes we forget that we're in the comfort business or the con confidence business. We think that we're selling technology or furniture or real estate or whatever it may be. And people will pay you to know how to do it even if it's easy for you because it's not always easy for them. How about this one? That job will take five minutes. I'm not even going to bill you for it. Same thing. Do you know how to do it? There's the story of Picasso and uh, a, a woman asked him if he would draw a sketch on a napkin and he did and he held the sketch out and he didn't let go of it when she grabbed it and she said well I said that'll be fifty thousand dollars she said fifty thousand dollars it it took you 10 seconds I said yes but it took me a lifetime to learn how to do it in 10 seconds so Dan, let me interrupt for a moment because I had some more slides, but we had a power failure and I want to respect the time. Um, another couple of minutes. You know, I'd like you to take the time you need, even if it means going a little long because you're present, because we can go past 1.30. Uh, so most folks will stick around and right. I, don't want you, I don't want you to cut short this amazing presentation. Right. I, am, I am enthused and inspired. Very good, just, just making sure, thank you. So that's the Picasso story. How long did it take you to learn what it is that you do so easily? And what is the value for the client? Oh, one of my favorites. This is just a, a, a great way to kill your integrity. Putting disclaimers. Sometimes we're working with pharma, we're working with healthcare products, and there's all of this speech that is, um, regulated speech and we have to say things a certain way and it really doesn't work with storytelling we have to find a way to tell the whole story instead of telling half the story and putting a disclaimer behind it batteries not included some assembly required all models are 18 years or older may cause nausea dizziness or vomiting oh i'm gonna buy that the i can do it cheaper story well maybe you can but should you? Because competing on price is a race to the bottom. Someone's going to undercut you and someone's going to undercut you and someone's, I mean, it's a race to the bottom. People are shopping for value. Yeah, we all want to get a good deal. We all want to get the best price, but I can think of places where I'll pay more because I care about reliability. I care about quality and I care about working with someone who knows my name. Sell your value your expertise, your guidance. As soon as you start competing on price, broke people make bail every day. There's plenty of money out there and there's plenty of opportunity for you to give somebody a break if they really need it, if you're charging everybody else a price that corresponds with your value. And of course, excellent work is done for excellent clients. Those ones who only care about they want it faster, they want it cheaper, send them to your competition. Change the conversation from price to value, because otherwise somebody's going to undercut you and they're going to get the sale, they're going to get the gig, they're going to get the consulting contract, even though what they offer is inferior. A few storytelling strategies. We talked about talking about yourself, yourself too much. Ladies, have you ever been this poor woman in this photograph where, oh, I should not stand in front of the photograph, right? Here we go. So you've got this, this woman here and she just can't wait for her friend to call with the phony emergency so she can say, um, Adam, I'm sorry, there's an emergency at home. I've got to run, maybe next time. So we have this scenario Boat yourself off the island, explore the world in a U-boat. Stop talking about yourself and start talking about them. And this happens in subtle ways. Um, I think you need this. We're proud to announce. Let me suggest. Our company offers. My product does. 
I, we, me, our, my, all of these things. I'd like to take this opportunity. They don't care what you'd like. Find ways to get that I language off of, out of your messaging and start focusing on the you language. After you tell the me story, like I did with my sailing trip, how do you switch gears to talk about the audience? You're in the middle and say, I know what you're thinking. You think I'm gonna talk about myself this whole presentation, boom. But I know what you're thinking is a great trigger for switching gears. Have you ever felt like that? That's the one I used. What does this mean to you? Long pause, let them think about it. So why do we care about storytelling? Boom, into the content. So important when we're creating messages, and this is such an important advertising concept, verbs are your spice cabinet for your messages. So if you were to do this workshop and maybe see a brochure, the typical brochure would show outcomes like this, how stories work, stories are about people, your magic power, what is the outcome, how to put your story to work, writing the message, platform skills, and visual storytelling. Okay, that's pretty boring, isn't it? Let's add some verbs and spice this up so that maybe, of course, hey, you're already here, and if you haven't left and you've stayed, that's great. Then how do we get people to come when they see the promotion? We add some verbs, discovering how stories work, telling stories, using your magic power, selling results, putting your story to work, writing the message, developing platform skills, and using visual storytelling, and we're almost there, but not quite. The problem is that we've activated the language, but some of these words are boring. Using, putting, developing, using again, eh, not very exciting. Let's get rid of the INGs, the participles for your grammar, grammar nerds out there, and let's make these into calls to action. Discover how stories work. Tell stories about people. Share your magic power. Sell results, not functionality. Inspire others with your story. Craft your message. Sharpen your platform skills and master visual storytelling. Collect those verbs that are aspirational and inspirational, embed them in your message, get rid of the INGs. Now, every one of these is a call to action. And implied is that if you take this workshop, you're going to learn to do these things, but activate the language and people will pay attention. Sell the outcomes. This is the old, sell the benefits, not the features, right? So here's the typical property listing, 4,000 square feet, central air, two blocks from the train station in a neighborhood with rising property values. It's a desirable neighborhood. It's close to an A school and it's close to downtown. Well, that's great, but it's boring. 4,000 feet means room for your growing family. It's comfortable during the summer with those air conditioners. Two blocks from the train station means you can avoid the traffic and the parking hassles if you work on Brickle. Rising property values means you recover your investment quickly. You'll grow your status living in a good neighborhood and impress others. Close to an A school means you get to take care of your family, a very important driver. And close to downtown means you save time commuting. This is a much more compelling real estate listing because it dovetails with the story of a particular buyer. And that buyer will likely compromise on the number of square feet or the power of the air conditioning unit if those family needs and commuting and business needs, the convenience needs are met. It's those survival level needs. The number of square feet Eh, nobody really cares. That's, that's one of the first things people will compromise on. So find and share your magic. It's not what you do, it's how and why you do it. Offer your magic power as your product and there will be no competition. There's only one you who does it the way you do it. 
with the insight and experience that you have. Put your story, that story, in the service of the people you work with and the people you work for. A little storytelling help, a couple of workshops. We've talked a little bit today about what to say. Uh, presentation skills are the whole other side of this. The pauses, the dynamics, the body language, the gestures, all of that stuff, how to say it. Something that uh, I coach speakers and offer workshops. You're working on the big pitch. There's so many things that people, people pitching big opportunities and they try to duplicate their website in a PowerPoint deck and then read the PowerPoint deck as if there needs to be a presenter present to slow down the reading of a PowerPoint deck. Anyway, pitches are important. And then take the cuss out of customer service. It's so important. We're the number one destination in the United States for visitors and hotels and service agencies are scrambling to hire people and they just don't understand the storytelling aspect and they are very frustrated in their jobs and sometimes the guests and visitors and customers are equally frustrated frustrated and then finally powerpoint is a whole other side of storytelling that goes with the pitches and stuff if i can be a value in any of these ways please reach out to me i'm happy to spend a little phone time with just about anybody without running the meter see if i can be of value to you in a nutshell that's story sailing i know i breeze through it pretty fast get that breeze sorry pardon the pun but i um i didn't want to finish on time and i did want to cover everything i will happily hang around and answer any and all questions provided they're not too tough <laughs> thank well you. Uh, thank you, Dave. And, and guys, uh, Sigrid Martinez had a question. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A button at the bottom. We'll have time for some Q&A and I have some of my own. Um, and then I actually, if you stick around, um, BizHack recently put together a little marketing flyer. And I'm going to actually do like a little breakdown of some of the storytelling that we were doing in the flyer. So if you're interested in that, Stick around for um, after this Q&A and we'll walk you through sort of my thinking in terms of how to put into action a lot of the principles that Dave has shared. So Sigrid Martinez said, great presentation, Dave. Thank you. I have a position as an environmental, social, and governance specialist. How do I convey this story to my coworkers? It's a new department. And sometimes I feel like my message is not getting across. So she is a, a position as an environmental, social, and governance specialist at a company? It's a big question and probably not one I could just come up with an answer because I don't quite understand the nuances of what you do either. So the title could be part of the prop, one of the problems with the story and that's quite common, but frame your story in terms of the outcomes that you produce. So you're this type of specialist. I make it easier for governments and agencies to do this. Um, I help so and so such a group accomplish this. Can you frame it in terms of the outcome and catch up with me? I'd be happy to to bat that around a little bit with you. Yeah, great answer. Great question, um, Tiffany. If you could put in the chat how people can um, reach Dave, um, uh, that that would be great. Uh, yeah, a lot of times, you know, we have a motto at BizHack that one size fits one. And part of this is because stories are one size fits one. Every person has their own story and they tell it in their own way. And so um, one other thing I would just add uh, to Sigrid, who's basically she's doing work in the company context and she wants to connect her work to her coworkers. Remember the be a guide, not the hero. Because if all you do is say, I do this, and I do that, and I do this, and I do that, and I'm going to make your life better because you do this, and I can help, and you do that, and I can help, and you do this, and I can help, and I have this that will help you, and oh, here's this short, they're the hero of their story. You got to use the you when talking about your work, and you'll, you'll see 
when I go through this, who's sitting in your marketing seat? It's all you, 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 then we, then me. So start with you and you say like, here's, I'm here to help you. How can I help? And try to connect that to them. Um, I don't see any other, let me see if I see any other questions. And I answered all possible questions in my presentation. You, you did, uh, and, uh, but you didn't answer all my questions. So. All right. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about, it's more of an observation, but you, you talked about excellent clients. That excellence, I think it was like excellent stories attract excellent clients. I said, ec excellent work is done for excellent clients. Excellent work is done for excellent clients. I wanted to talk about, about this idea that I've been thinking a lot about, which is telling your business story differentiates you by definition from the competition, right? Because it's your story and your story is different than your competitor's story. But the other thing that it does, which is even more exciting to me, is it attracts your ideal customer. Talk to me about that, Dave, how telling your story, and we define in BizHack, your story is your why and your what. Why you do what you do, your core values, and what you do, your core purpose. So when you talk about your values and your purpose, you attract your ideal customer. You want to talk about that, Dave? Well, it's more than talking about your values and your purpose. It's it's showing your values and your purpose, not just what you do, but how you do it. So for example, I recently gave a workshop for Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau, and it was short, the whole thing was a half an hour. But during that presentation, I had people come up and I coached them on reading lines, on little, little snippets of a speech. And we took those from, well, I'm gonna read the line with emphasis to, well, let's add the pauses and the dynamics. And all of a sudden, the lines came to life and the audience was laughing. They were feeling the, the mood, the tone in ways that they didn't expect to, even though they'd heard the line read four times. And I'll give you an example real quick. Take a line like, the hardest thing to live with is regret. Well, I'm not gonna go through all the steps. What if we think about the word hardest and the word regret? and what they sound like. And what if we add a long pause in between for people to wait on the edge of their seats for the answer? So the hardest thing to live with. It's regret. And you know, all of a sudden everyone's, wow, it's different, including the person who delivered that line. So when I do that, then people, I had a couple of people come up to me and said, can you coach me? Or um, I'm working on a presentation. Can you help? Or can you work with my team? We need to get them out of their shells. They're too, um, they're too shy. They're not engaging with our customers. So show what you do and show how you do it differently. Show you how you do it uniquely. And it's even better than telling about your values and your techniques and your magic power. Show it. And then you attract those customers who appreciate what you're offering. And the ones who say, what's that for? I don't need that. Okay, go with God, but go. Yeah. Find, work with someone who offers what you need. Yeah, we talked about show, don't tell when I was getting my writing. So if you can show that these are your values, it's much more powerful than simply telling people these are your values, especially if you might not actually live up to them. Um, but what I've found is that if you, if you have a values-driven marketing approach, if you have a purpose-driven marketing approach, and all that starts with articulating your business story, you tend to attract people with similar values and who are attracted to purpose-driven entrepreneurs. And so we've actually started to talk in, in, internally about purpose-driven digital marketing. Right, because there's a lot of digital marketing that's just technical in nature. That's about like automations and advertising. And we at BizHack have a different philosophy, which is marketing is human to human. Humans connect on values and purpose. And we're gonna make sure that your digital marketing through our methodology has values and purpose at its core. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about was magic and your use of the word magic. We also talk at BizHack, and this is actually a term that I learned from Facebook called the magic moment. And the magic moment is when you go, it's, a, it's when somebody's using your product or service and they go from try to believer. They go from tester to convert. Um, for BizHack, we believe that the magic moment is seeing me or one of our uh, certified instructors present. So we try to do everything we can to get in front of people to talk about our purpose-driven, values-driven digital marketing approach, because we believe once you get that, if you're our kind of person, you're going to be hooked. That's the magic moment. So a lot of our marketing is really focused on getting speaking engagements uh, for me and for our other certified instructors, whether in person or in, on the webinar. So that, that's the magic moment. And, and I loved that you talked about magic. And so I just wanted to hear you reflect a little bit about the magic in storytelling and the magic in marketing. Well, I think there's, I mean, certainly, like I said, we, we've all got caught up in a movie, a good one or a bad one, because we're pulled along by the, the tide. If we're pulled out to sea by the tide of the story, Tor stories have a gravitational pull and we need to find out where they end up. And if we're lost somewhere between conflict and transformation that causes that story trauma, but I like to believe we're all good at something. Now, coaching speakers is something if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I had no interest in it, I had no practice in it. And it turns out to be you know, for me, it, it's, it's transformational for me. And what I love about it is I can work with a speaker and they start off shy they're looking at their feet they give you the limp noodle handshake and they need to get that confidence and after not much time the message is focused now they may still be an introvert look i lived on a sailboat for 15 years i invented introvert but all the same it's that ability to transform somebody and i didn't even begin to touch on that till I was in my early 50s. I'm 57 now. So when you start thinking about you know, whatever your magic power is, you may not have discovered it yet, or you may have something else that brings you to it. But find, find that you know, and don't overlook it, because very often it's that thing where, where people say, you know, Dan, you're so good at that. And you go, that's well, just it's natural. I don't know. I just do it. And you don't value it because it comes natural to you. What are the things that your friends and colleagues say about you? Like, that's just brilliant. That's genius. And you're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. That may very well be your magic power. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but. No, it's, it's, um, there's your magic. And then there's the magic of how do you, how do you kind of like give that little bottle up that magic and give the magic to your customer? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, and, and sometimes they're related. Like my magic power is that like, you know, while you were gone, I did like a 10 minute or whatever, like little mini presentation about storytelling and the history of storytelling and, and, and how to then apply that to, you know, building your website. Mm -hmm. And all of that was done completely extemporaneously and off the top of my head. Now, I'm super highly trained in how to do that. I've been 10 years on an improv comedy troupe. I have a master's degree in storytelling. I was a broadcaster for NPR and PBS. I have studied how to present uh, effectively for broadcast, for, to project my voice. Like, that didn't just happen. But it is my magic power. And so, and, and I enjoy it. Like, I like the challenge of like extemporizing. And that's my magic moment that mm -hmm. if somebody sees that and they're like, oh my God, I want some of that for me, then they are really converted to wanting to be, go from like a prospect to kind of a, a, a really, it's, it's an important part of the, the buyer's journey, let's say. Yeah. And um, it's interesting, Dan, you talk about this, like people will say, Oh, Dave, you're such a natural speaker. And I'm thinking, I'm not, a, I'm like, like you, I'm not a natural speaker. I've studied speaking. I've practiced speaking. I've 
evaluated over a thousand short speeches. I have, you know, given speeches and gotten ovations and I've bombed and I've gone through all of that and I'm still learning. And then someone says, oh, you're a natural. It's like going to Yo-Yo Ma and saying, you're a natural cello player. He's going to be offended. It's like, well, thank you, but you're overlooking all of those hours he spent practicing. Like everybody else, I was born not knowing how to say a word. So when it comes to your magic power, you may have some raw talent. But if you take that talent and you nurture it and you polish it and you grow it, that's where, you know, you, you, you might be a wizard, but you got to go to Hogwarts to, to learn the skills. I love it. Yeah, like Harry Potter was gifted, supernaturally gifted, literally as a wizard. Mm -hmm. But he also worked his tail off um, and he studied and, 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 and he became the greatest wizard through a combination of skill and hard work. And, you know, look, <laughs> no matter how much you train, Dave, you're not going to become an NBA basketball player. Like there are certain unique gifts, what um, we sometimes call UQ or unique qualities that you're born with that you can't do anything. But look, um, Stephon Curry, the greatest basketball player, three-point shooter in the history of the game, is a normal size dude. I mean, he's probably like 6'1". Uh, he probably weighs 200 pounds. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands of basketball players with that size and that body, but he has worked harder than anyone else to become the greatest uh, three-point shooter there ever was. I am naturally gifted. I'm a very fast thinker. I'm a very gifted oral and written communicator. That was true even before I started my 10,000 hours of study but I was really intentional about it. And, you know, they talk a lot about sort of leaning into your strengths um, versus trying to shore up your weaknesses. And I'm a really big believer in this idea, which is you will move, if, if you take what you're the best 1% in the world at, and then you make a study of it, you can become one of the best in the world at that thing. Whereas if you take what you're really bad at, finance, right? Like, you know, numbers or doing the books, whatever it is that you're bad at. I'm great at losing money. Yeah, exactly. Making money, whatever it is. You, you, you often need to get to a level of competence in order to run a business. Like, like I had to really, I'm not, I'm actually pretty numbers orient, uh, uh, oriented, but I'm not like, I don't have like a, an accounting personality, but I did need to study, um, like financial statements so that I knew how to run my business effectively. But I, once I got to a certain point, I then knew, okay, I'm going to hire someone to do this for me. And we hired a fractional uh, CFO and I have an accountant and a bookkeeper uh, and, and they take care of it. And then I just read the numbers uh, as best I can and find the stories inside of them because that's what I do. So, so as a business owner, you do need to shore up your weaknesses, especially if you're like a small business or solopreneur, you're going to wear many hats. But the goal really should be to identify your unique qualities and lean into those. And that's how you'll really get out of this like small, small business and you'll actually be able to grow. Well, we've taken up a lot of time uh, of you. Uh, Dave, with your permission, I'm gonna transition um, into a quick presentation that, that I was gonna do um, as the follow-up. Were there any other things, that, uh, calls to action or anything else that you wanted to share? By the way, the word call to action is my favorite word in all of marketing. And I love uh, how you converted pieces of texts into calls to action in a really systematic way. I think that was a beautifully done exercise. Thank you. Um, anything you wanna share before we wrap up your uh, portion of the pr uh, presentation? No, I think, I, I think I've, I've done that, but um, I, I don't have the chat window on the screen when I when I did before my power failure I saw lots of compliments so thank you for your your time and your attention today I'm I'm honored and pleased if there's anything I can do to uh, serve you help you solve these problems reach out to me Dave at DaveBricker.com or visit my website at storysailing.com and um, let's find out how to uh, get you that transformation you're looking for.